But in, in my opinion, mink trapping is really the purest form of trapping. Nobody hunts mink. It's, it, the mink is the animal really made for the trapper. And with the rich history of mink and mink trapping, and uh, when mink fur was big and worth a lot of money, and there's stories of uh, guys that go to the bank and want to want the loan to buy a farm, and they'd say, "What's your collateral?" And they say, "I saw a mink trap last week." So, uh, mink, mink, mink is just so entrenched in trapping, and I think that's why I love it because I love I love the history of trapping. So I want to start off by saying, my mink trapping is not what I would consider methods to put up the biggest numbers. Um, to put up the biggest numbers, you need to utilize every type of set um, and come up with a system to make that work. Because sometimes certain sets may be out of commission. Everybody knows what the weather's like, you know, in trapping season. Like I said, my mink trapping is fun. So I blind set mink and I, I don't, first off, everybody knows pocket sets are, the Midwest guys catch huge numbers of mink on, on in pockets. And one, one of my mentors, Jim Whitmer, if you know him, he's from this district. I rode with him one day a year for many, many years on his mink line. And, and Jim's a big pocket set guy. And Jim caught some big numbers of mink and muskrats in pocket sets. I do make a baited set and I'll make a baited set if I have no other options and I really want to trap that area. And the baited set that I've had the most luck with, um, pocket set's excellent. I will make some pocket sets, but a, a quick set I'll make is, everybody heard of a rock sandwich set? I think Russ Carmen's kind of one of the guys that popularized it. And of course, he's in uh, Pennsylvania. There's a lot of rocks there. A guy in the Midwest ain't gonna be able to do that. I know when I beaver trap in North Carolina, you couldn't find a rock to fill a bag anywhere. If we were looking for bridges that had rip wraps, there'd be no rip wrap in the truck so we could do ground and bag. So that's kind of a Pennsylvania thing. Another mentor of mine, uh, John Homo, he, he did that set too. And when I use bait, I mean, I sell lots of lure. I have a lot of different lures, but I don't have a mink lure. Um, what I found works best for me if I'm running bait is a mink carcass. Um, I keep foxes, so my muskrat carcass get fed to my foxes. I ain't gotta use them for bait. But so I use mink carcasses and they work really well. But my, my baited sets are very, very limited. So it's only when I need to. And another one reason why that is, is it's just more to deal with. And I do not like catching raccoons make trap. This is my standard trap. Um, I have a bunch of mink traps, but uh, this is pretty well all I use. It is the old number two Victor Square job. And that one has a Barker's mink pan on it. Uh, there's a fellow by Mike Kelly out in Minnesota. He makes a really nice mink pan that costs a little bit. These are all right, they work. That's about your standard length of chain on a number two Victor. I do put a swivel in there, um, a split ring, and that length of chain with a Bob Best and Tom on the end. And this gives me I have a lot of brake rotors and I have tie plates, but I don't care if the brake rotors get sunk, so they get stashed all over my line. The tie plates come home with me because they're a tough commodity to, to get a hold of. So, but I use a lot of brake rotors. I will be showing something later here that was a total game. It's a total game changer in my mink trapping. Um, if you follow my YouTube video, I show it in there, but th this, this changed my world. Um, and just on the, on the subject of weights, you know, you, you see a lot of videos and, and, you know, read books and stuff and guys that just use a grapple. Um, and some of that reasoning found a lot of times, your slower water I do better. And the reason for that is especially at your smaller streams, um, I learned this through trapping pipe culverts. One side is usually better and a lot of times it's the side where the flow comes out to and i think these mink are coming down coming through the pipe and they just go through the flow and kind of ride it out right on top of your trap and, and, and I, that's a theory i don't know but i just know from looking at especially those plastic corrugated pipe culverts um, if it's just a little trickle through them i i definitely see the side where the flow hits, I, I do better. 
Um, the other thing about those pipe culverts is, I just thought of now, if there isn't a lot of water through them, those corrugated ones, and I set the entry and exit points of the pipe, um, just kind of at the, at the edges where something would crawl in and out, you're, you're gonna catch a pile of coon. I mean, the coon use those. If the water's pretty deep and a coon has to swim, I eliminate a huge number of coon. But if a coon can walk through that pipe, you're gonna catch a pile of them those type of sets. But I'll talk about the different things about pipes later. I'll get back to my... So, face rock at your, at your bridge wall. I found that at bridge walls, if I put a good face rock there, it'll last through floods. At pipes, just I guess the geometry of them, the way the water flows through, everything's gone every year. I gotta rebuild every year. But at my bridge, my big bridge walls, if I have a good base rock, I usually can come back. And when I'm done, my smaller rocks, because I took the time to hunt nice flat ones, they go up on the bridge or somewhere where I can find them again next year. I don't let them in there because high swift water goes through, they're gonna be, you know, they're gonna be gone. But it's, it's simply this. Um, if say the water level's right there, bridge walls here. That trap goes like that. How many books have you ever read? I watch videos of guys are digging sod, um, trying to stabilize that like it's a fox set. And that was a, a, a huge epiphany for me. And I saw that in Don's video. Um, this 100% comes from that man is plopping a trap down on a hard surface. And you might look at it and say, well, that's gonna fall off or that's gonna tip and they're gonna, no. You're gonna catch a pile of me. A couple years ago, um, I, I was catching, I was doing really good and I was gonna hit a personal best on mink and I was just struggling through. And I got caught up in an ice and snow disaster. My poor wife over there, I made her go with me and she helped me pull that line. And there was that much snow and ice. What I would do is I'd jump, I put in the chest waders on, which I hate. And I jumped down in there and I couldn't crawl up the bank with my weights and my traps and all that stuff. So I'd hand it up to her, she loaded in the truck, and then I'd crawl, find a way to crawl up. Um, that year, when I, when I did that, I was gonna do a modification to some of my brake rotors, so I pulled everything. And uh, I was really tired and I didn't unload my truck. And it was, I had a cap on my truck, I opened up and I threw everything right in the back. It, so all the way it was toward the back. Well, I took a drive and of course I broke the leaf spring because I had too much weight. So, but I'll get to something there that eliminates that headache forever. Okay, now the next thing. This is gonna be the thing I've never demoed before. I never showed it anywhere. I was saving it for this. I'll probably do a YouTube video on it sometime, but I was saving it for, for this deal. I tried a bunch of different stuff um, to do top edges in deep water. I, I made rods through my brake rotors and that worked pretty good. That, that worked real well. And I still have some of those stashed in places. But what I was telling you before, bridges in my area are, that are getting replaced, are getting replaced with these prefab concrete structures. And, and they're, I like them, but at the bottom of them, it comes to an angle doesn't come to a 90 degree, like the, the wall to the, the concrete floor of these structures. It's just, there, it doesn't, you know, it isn't street bottom there. There's a bottom there, a concrete bottom there. And I was finding, when I put a rod through a brake rotor, I have adjustment. You turn that brake rotor, and you can get it closer or further away from the wall just by turning it. It's round. Um, and if you're, you know, obviously if you're, rod is on one side you can get it closed but I found at a lot of these bridges with the slanted bottom I could not get this to work the way I wanted it. Make this about as high as my hip hoops because I really ain't going a lot more deeper water than that. I think they're three foot. Uh, well I had not got a rebar and you know whatever it doesn't have to be. I like a little bit heavier rod. I tried some with three eight and it's too light. Uh, so I go with at least half inch, but re-rod's okay. I like the smooth rod better because it adjusts easier. The re-rod will chatter, and sometimes your trap will go wrong. Um, 
Um, so the last ones I made up, this is, a, this is a brand new one I made out of half inch. And this item is called a hang. If you watch my YouTube videos, and I'm, I'm ginger with this trap, because this is right off the line. I didn't tighten up the pan <coughs> just for the demo, so I could get caught. But these work, they hang by the dog, like so. And you can, you can pull that, that's a wing nut. You can pull that wing nut out and hook your swivel or whatever to that, and that'll stay with the, with the rod. And that's fine if you can do that. I don't like to do that simply because there's not a, you're gonna catch a lot of coon in deep water. You get some, but not a lot. But I'm in, I'm in you know, deep water bridges, and like I said, if I get a mink and he pulls that rod into deep water, I'm gonna put chest waders on. And as I said before, I hate to put chest waders on. So this is how this system works. I'm gonna find a wall. Just the wing nut, move her up and down. Um, sometimes I will put a rock on that T part on the bottom, but that's all it's good. I will have that trap, you know, like I said, on, on a weight. But how much simpler can it get to deep water? It's as easy as it is. Now, I just decreased the value of every Hector number two square jaw on this ground because you can't do that with a round jaw trap. It, it, it'll just lean over the side. It has to be a square jaw trap. His, his, his name, Matt, and it just came to me. I'm really terrible at remembering names and stuff, but his name, I think, was Joe Salvatore. He was from the western part of the state, and at, at Don's event one year, Minktoberfest, Dave Eccles brought a device that this man built, manufactured, he used it. He used them on his cool line, and he called them bow ties. And it was a big nut that he drilled multiple holes in, and he ran loops of cable through them. Um, and that wrapped around the rock, he cinched them tight, and that's what he used for his cooler. And he gave everyone one to take home, and I took it home, and it's an amazing idea, but I just did not feel like drilling, uh, drilling these nuts out. Because you gotta, you know, you're gonna go through drill bits on a hard steel nut, and to make a lot of them, it would have been, it would have taken some time. And as I said before about John Hummel, he, he had probably the first guy that ever showed me that rock sandwich set. He used to just take a snare, and well, he actually used, it's called a Thompson's tree lock, and he put a little bend on that lock, and that made it cinch up, made it lock up a little tighter. And he would just cinch that around rocks, and that worked great for mink weights. Problem was, a lot of times you get a coon in there, and they go flopping down along the stream, and with only one strand of, uh, cable, snare cable around it, it could come off the one side. If you didn't have the perfect rock, you know, you, you needed the perfect rock. So this is another deal that one day the light bulb went off and I used both of those guys' ideas and came up with something that I could make really quick. And honestly, I don't, I think I, think I cut the cable eight to six feet. Um, I have to measure it. I mean, every time I make more, I, I measure it again to see what, I think it's six foot. And any, any decent snare lock is gonna work. These are slim locks. These we used to be able to use them for beaver and Pennsylvania, but now our beaver locks are the same as our cable restraint locks. So I had to pile these slim locks. So these work fine for that. But whatever, it does, the lock doesn't really matter. You just want something that locks up pretty tight. So this way, and it's just a snare on both ends. It's one, one string of cable with a snare on both ends. Not rocket science. And my idea behind this was, it gave me the two loops to hold the rock, like Joe Salvatore's bow tie, and it was simple to make and used a snare lock, like John Hummel's method. And this worked pretty well, pretty good as it was. I ain't gonna cinch that up super tight, but I, I leave, I make these up, I leave them. You know what I mean? I ain't dragging, I ain't taking this off when my hands are cold and whatnot. I'll just simply go back to my shed, 
and make up more if for some reason I would happen to lose one. But nobody steals these. They'll steal rotors. They'll steal tie plates. They could have steal a lot with a piece of bend up cable. You know? um, but I, I really found the real secret to doing these and making these work and that they're going to hold coon is you just take a universal swivel and hook, hook to your middle of your cable with a J hook. And what that does for you, you take your Bob Best toggle. Go through there, ginger with this trap. Now what that does is it centers the force of that cable equally on both loops. And why is that important? Because every rock is a different shape. Your one side may be, you know, you're using more of that cable than the other side if it's narrower. By using that slideable J hook on that universal swivel, it's gonna center it up every time. Equal pressure, so you don't have more pressure on the one than the other to give a chance of it coming off. And they, these are almost impossible to get off by dragging it along, you know, you need to get down there with your fingers. But yeah, I tried some PMIs and they work waxed. The Dukes work great waxed. The one thing I do do with the Dukes is, and I have a YouTube video of this, um, is I'll take a nail and the side, it would be the inside, I punch a nail down through there and that widens that up a little bit because sometimes what, what I saw was happening where the dog, the notches in the dog were a little bit too wide and the trigger would actually slide up there and your trigger wouldn't, would go really far one way. Um, going out, it's, if that's where the point of contact is and the pressure is, you know, pushing it out, it's gonna go off every time, but it was pushing it in. So that kind of solved that. Um, and when you wax the, the dupes, when you wax them, they kind of have a four-way trigger. I, I like four-way triggers. Uh, I want every advantage in my favor of that trap going off for me. Um, and I, I think a four-way, you know, there's a lot of guys and a lot better meat trappers than I am, and a lot of big numbers guys, and they're tying wires on there and stuff, and I'm nothing against that. But I, to me, I just, it's just a personal thing. I don't like to have to add anything to that trap that I don't have. It's like I don't use steel screen for canine trapping or pan covers or anything like that. I don't like to have to add anything to it or have to replace wires at the end of the season and whatnot. So I really feel waxing lets me get away with not, it's pretty hard for them to get through. You'll get your fingers in them enough, you'll know. It's pretty hard for me to get through a wax trap. I know, I know a couple other guys that do it too, and, and you know they kind of think the same thing. They think once in a wax, you know you're not gonna you're not gonna miss too many. But yeah, I, 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 a lot of guys contact me and ask about. I, I know where I get them, but I don't know the right name. But it's a heavy industrial curved washer. I mean, I'm guessing it's for bolting something to a round bridge, you know, pillar or something. I, I don't know. Um, Where'd you get them at? I get them at a place in Pottsville. It's a steel supply place. But if you look up, uh, if you look up Fazio Steel, they have a place in Jersey. Uh, they have a couple stores. It used to be a Fazio's, but they Fazio's has them too. Because we had one years ago.